By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another Timmy's Top 10. And today we are looking at the Top 10 Enchantments. And as you can see, there are a lot of contenders to go on this Top 10 list. And when I was actually making the list itself, I found out that there are more than 160 enchantments in old school magic and there are just so many candidates to go in the top 10 and maybe that is because enchantments um, really their quality the power of an enchantment really depends on the moment of play on the deck that it's played in and i feel that's even more so than with for instance artifacts or creatures the two top 10s that i've done before um, so you could say enchantments are a little bit more conditional. Nonetheless, I do believe there are just a few enchantments that are so powerful that they deserve a spot in the top 10. Now please remember that this is purely based on my experience playing old school magic uh, for the last two, three years here in uh, actively in tournaments in the Netherlands and it's based on what I've seen online and the games I've played online and offline. So uh, this is in no way an official list. And please let me know what your opinion is and what is your favorite enchantment in old school magic and why. Please leave a comment. I'm very interested to hear that. So now that that's out of the way, let's go to the honorable mentions. And these are my honorable mentions. And as you can see, there are eight in total. So that's quite a lot. And I, I could have easily made this 10 or even 15. There are just so many great enchantments, flavorful enchantments and enchantments that can really turn the game around. Also, a lot of enchantments are, as I was going through the list, kind of conditional. So it depends on when you use them and how you use them. Cards like Stasis, Power Artifact, Nether Void, and Field of Dreams, even Fast Bond, are really good enchantments. But they're particularly good when you build a deck around them. And then they can really be game changers. Cards like Gloom and Circle of Protection are also fantastic, but they are sideboard cards. And they can change the game around when playing against certain decks. So... I mean, play them in your sideboards. They're fantastic. Um, and then there is the presence of the master. And that's kind of the oddball out here. And there's a little story attached to this because I was playing in the summer derby two years ago and I was having some enchantment issues. And then my opponent said, well, do you play with any enchantments? And I said, well, actually I don't, but I don't really see what enchantment I should play. I mean, I've got a COP red in my sideboard. And then he told me, why not add a presence of the master to your deck. It's only one white and three, so it's easy to splash. And what Presence of the Master does, for those of you who, who are not familiar with the card, uh, it says, while Presence of the Master is in play, all new enchantments that uh, are cast are countered. So in other words, while it's in the game, no other enchantments can enter the game. And yes, it is Albert Einstein on the on the art here. And it's just, it's beautiful, made by, uh, by Foglio. Uh, Phil, I believe, not Kaya. And uh, I think it's beautiful art, it's very flavorful, and I've enjoyed playing it, especially against those robots decks that tend to copy my Triskelions. It's been really fantastic kind of countering those copy artifacts. And also it, it has been a big help against those Lantex, um, Lance Edge decks as well. So this is um, my honorable mention list. Now let's quickly go to number 10. The first one on this list, number 10, is Control Magic. So it's two blue and two, it's an enchant creature, and you control target creature until enchantment is discarded or the game ends. You can't tap target creature this turn, but if it was already tapped, it stays tapped until you can untap it. If destroyed, target creature is put into owner's graveyard. Now what it doesn't say is perhaps the biggest downside of Control Magic, is that when Control Magic is destroyed, the creature goes back under its owner's control. So that means that all of a sudden the creature threat is back again. Uh, but I still think it's a really, really good enchantment because first of all, it's a two for one. You get a creature, your opponent loses a creature. And what's even better, or well, I guess it's better. Sometimes you have these situations where you control magic creature of your opponent and your opponent is then kind of forced to use removal on his own creature. And then it's even a better deal because your opponent is losing a creature and is losing a powerful removal spell. Now, obviously, there is always this danger of your opponent being able to use a Chaos Orb on your control magic or being able to use a Disenchant or any other way to get rid of your control magic. Now, a way of obviously protecting it because you are playing with blue is keeping Counterspell in your hand and the availability to play it. Um, so I think control magic being the fact that it is a blue card, so you probably play with counter spells as well, is a very powerful enchantment. Now let's continue to number nine. 
And here, number nine, another blue enchantment. And this is the copy artifact. And it's interesting here. It's a one blue and one, and it reads, select any artifact in play. This enchantment acts as a duplicate of target artifact. Uh, I should say of that artifact. Enchantment copy is affected by cards that affect either enchantments or artifacts. Enchantment copy remains even if the original artifact is destroyed. And this is an interesting line here. So it remains even if the original artifact is destroyed. You don't see that on every clone card. Um, so it copies an artifact in play and this is extremely powerful in the robots deck where it is used to copy Triskelions very quickly and together with anime dead, they can get out of hand very, very quickly. I, I can tell you that I've been there. Uh, it's not nice when you're when you're facing that deck. Uh, besides this uh, limited use in robots, copy artifact is also a great uh, great card to copy your mistress factory with. Uh, but in general, in a format like old school where you see so many artifacts, having an enchantment for just two mana that can copy every every artifact on the board is extremely powerful in my book. On number eight, we find Underworld Dreams. And Underworld Dreams is three black and it reads, Underworld Dreams does one damage to opponent for each card he or she draws. Now there is a whole Underworld Dreams deck where you won't just want to play with a lot of wheel effects, forcing your opponent to draw. So when you play Wheel of Fortune, your opponent loses seven life. When you play a Time Twister, your opponent loses seven life. When you play a Brain Geyser on your opponent, your opponent loses loses when you play a winds of change and you have to shuffle for a new hand exactly your opponent loses life again equal to the amount of cards drawn this also works great with a howling mine obviously so you have that underworld dreams but outside of the underworld dreams deck you kind of see this enchantment taking uh, becoming a presence in more and more uh, decks so for instance, Mono Black Underworld Dreams is seen a lot because it just gets those extra few points of damage in uh, that your opponent, and your opponent is already struggling because of that early uh, black creatures that are kind of smashing into him. And then you also have that Underworld Dreams just adding to that time clock. So Underworld Dreams, very powerful card and it's here on number eight. On number seven, we find Moat. Now this is a classic for two white and two non-flying creatures cannot attack. Now I have to be honest, at first when I saw Moat, um, I thought, okay, you know, if you just have a flying creature, it's no problem. Uh, you can just get rid of the enchantment. Um, you can even give your own creature flying. So I didn't really see the value of this card uh, until I started playing old school magic more on a tournament level. And I started to see that Moat is really a solution um, to, to a lot of frequently played creatures, such as the Urnum Jinn, such as the Mistress Factory. And yes, of course, eventually somebody will take care of Moat and Moat is gone. But I believe that the reason that people play Moat and why you see it in a lot of deck sideboards is that it buys you time and it buys you those few extra turns that you need to kind of get your pieces together and win the game. So Moat buys you time. That's what Mo does and I think it does that really well against a lot of different decks. That's why it's here on number seven. On number sec six we find uh, Anime Dead. Anime Dead is one black and one and it's an enchant dead creature which I think is really cool that it's dead creature and not just enchant creature. And any creature in either player's graveyard comes into play on your side with minus one to its original power. If this enchantment is removed or at the end of game, target creature is returned to its owner's graveyard. Target creature may be killed as normal. Now what I think is, is, is really cool about this card is that you can pick anybody's graveyard. So you can pick your own, but also your opponents. And that means that it works really well with, you know, if you play creatureless and you play with Wrath of Gods or other like board swipes like a disc for instance, uh, sorry, board wipes, like for instance a disc, then you get to pick the best creature from your opponent. You can even play this in combination with a millstone, milling your opponent, finding a good creature and playing an anime dead on that. You know, it's it's a very versatile card. And of course you can also use it in your own tactic where you say, okay, I have a certain creature that I want to get back all the time. Uh, to give you an example, I recently built a Guardian of the Beast deck with discs in it and I also played with four anime dead because I could always get my beast back but if my opponent had a big beefy creature in his graveyard after after my disc you know blew off 
um, I would just use the enemy dead on his graveyard and I would take back some of his creatures and I've, I've actually found two uh, Sheevan Dragons not too long ago in that deck thanks to the enemy dead. So for me enemy dead is extremely powerful and just for the art alone I would play it but the fact that it's also a very useful card makes it even better and that's why it's here on number six. Number five is one of those cards. Oh man, uh, for me it's really hard to play against this card. It's land tax, it's one white, it's an enchantment. During your upkeep, if an opponent controls more land than you, you may search your library and remove up to three basic land cards and put them in the, into your hand. Reshuffle your library afterwards. Now I can tell you, if you're playing against somebody who has an active land tax going, it's going to be really difficult for you. Because the problem is, when your opponent is taking out the lands, it means they're going to draw valuable spells. The chances of that or higher so that means that he or she can put pressure on you all the time especially in those white weenie decks but of course we've seen land text a lot lately with lands edge which is the enchant world that reads you can discard a land card and deal two damage to any target so that means you can just discard your lands and deal two damage to your opponent and um I actually think it's only your opponent it's not to any target by the way so it's two damage to your opponent so you can just collect the lands you need and then kill your opponent in one go, in one big swoop of land discard craziness. Um, and But besides that deck, land text is also very useful in White Weenie and just useful in a lot of decks. You see it being played in a lot of tactics. I think especially in EC this could be very useful uh, with the strip mines of course. But besides, besides that you see uh, that a lot of decks have uh, land hate now because of the library of Alexandria and because of all the dual lands So just having your land text can kind of help you finding Basic lands and kind of get ahead as well and when you combine this with cards like ivory tower You can also gain a lot of life. So land text here on number five On number four we actually find more or less a sideboard card energy flux It's one blue and two and it reads all artifacts in play now require an upkeep cost of two in addition to any other upkeep costs they may have. If the upkeep cost for an artifact is not paid, the artifact must be discarded. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, it's a great card, but isn't this just like Gloom and COP Red? Isn't this just a fantastic art, uh, sideboard card and that's it? Well, if you've been playing old school magic in the last two, three years, online, offline, in your local playgroup, you've probably noticed that every old school deck that has some, some significance plays with a lot of artifacts. And so more and more people have started to play Energy Flux main board. And I actually play also played main board in one of my builds, my budget blue aggro where I play this thing main because it's it's such a powerhouse if if you don't if you yourself are not committed to artifacts of course and it can really be a huge a huge problem for for your opponent so energy flux definitely very powerful card and it's here on number four on number three we find the abyss and an enchant world and for one black and three it reads all players bury one target non-artifact creature under their control if they have any during their upkeep. I think one of the things that makes the Abyss so powerful is the fact that it doesn't go away when all the creatures are destroyed. Think for instance of Pestilence or think of Drop of Honey. Those are two enchantments that basically destroy themselves when there are no artifacts in play. The Abyss really doesn't mind. No creatures? That's fine. And of course it says non-artifact creatures, which makes it ideal to combine with an artifact deck. But it's also great to combine with a creatureless deck. It's another card that goes fantastic with Mistress Factory. So for me the Abyss is very versatile. The big downside of the Abyss is, you play it out on your turn and you have to wait until your opponent's upkeep before it actually gets rid of the creatures of your opponent. So that does mean that your opponent has some time to respond to the Abyss. In all honesty, I think I think that makes the card at least a little bit more balanced. The fact that it's just one black, which is kind of exceptional for black cards, because usually, you know, like Hypnotic Spectre and Underworld Dreams that we looked at earlier, you have to be more committed to black. But the Abyss is really just saying, hey man, you can splash me, I'm only one black. So yeah, very interesting card, very strong card, and it's here on number three. 
Now on number two, we have Blood Moon. And Blood Moon is, again, one of those cards that you may think, isn't this a sideboard card? It's one red and blue, and it reads, all non-basic lands are now basic mountains. Again, it's one of those cards that a lot of people play main, just like with Energy Flux, because so many people play multiple colored decks. And even if they don't play multiple colored decks, they play a lot of special lands. So you can think of Mishra's Factory, Library of Alexandria, and Stripmine. A maze of if of course being unrestricted now so blood moon takes care of all of them now that we're talking about maze of if actually i'm playing with blood moon in my goblin decks and when i'm playing for instance against a, a, a mono color deck like mono green white weenie you know a mono black usually opponents go like oh okay blood moon i don't care i don't mind but usually blood moon does take care of those very annoying maze of ifs that kind of prevent me from dealing any damage and it also gives a mountain to my um, opponent which means that my mountain walk is activated and I can do my really flavorful and old-fashioned combo goblin king and my goblins get mountain walk and I walk over you um, so blood moon can be very powerful uh, it can really wreck games. Now, of course, the big problem here with Blood Moon is that a lot of players already play with a few basic planes in their decks, so they can always cast a Disenchant, and they also play with a Mox Pearl so that they can cast a Disenchant. So Blood Moon is maybe less of a game changer than it it can be, but I still think it's extremely powerful and it's one of that, those enchantments that sometimes can win you the game and if it doesn't win you the game, it's a huge problem that your opponent has to deal with. So for me, it's a number two. Now let's go to number one. On number one, we find Sylvan Library and if you've been paying attention, you probably already saw that the background picture is a blurred version of the Sylvan Library. Sylvan Library is one green and one and it reads, you may draw two extra cards during your draw phase, then either put two of the cards drawn this turn back on top of your library in any order or lose four lives per card not replaced. Effects that prevent or redirect damage may not be used to counter this loss of life. Now Sylvan Library is insane i mean at first glance you might think okay it's two mana you need to wait an entire turn before you can take advantage you only get to look at your top three cards and i mean i have to pay four life that's a lot of life to just get an extra card but here's the thing life or not mana so you're not paying four mana you're paying four life so you're drawing an extra card and yes you lose four life but i mean all your lands are still untapped and you can start playing out extra things as a matter of fact Salem library is one of the only cards that kind of help you going through your deck faster so you can find your answers to what your opponent doing or you can find your combo pieces obviously sylvan library is used you know based on what your deck is all about but sylvan is just fantastic and don't forget that in old school magic I mean, everybody plays with Swords of Plows here. So if they destroy, for instance, my Urnum Jin or my Sarah Angel or my Suchi, the Swords gives me four life. Now, all of a sudden, those four life equal another card. And when you start thinking about that, it's, it means, okay, you've lost the Swords, I've lost a creature. But because of Sylvan Library, next turn, so at the end, you know, it's almost my turn now. I'm going to be able to draw an extra card. So thank you for that. So it's actually card advantage for me. So you're kind of turning the tables around playing a Sylvan Library. It's really um, just an extremely powerful card. Again, this is based on, on my experiences. So this is my top 10 list. Here you can see the entire list in front of you. So my number one is Sylvan Library. I am sure you have an opinion about this. Let me know what your number one is and why. And if you agree with uh, my number one, also let me know. And for now, thank you for watching this episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you'd like to see more top tens, let me know what top ten you'd like to see next. If you haven't seen the other two top tens yet about artifacts and, and, and creatures, uh, have a look on the channel and um, you'll definitely find them. If you're not a subscriber yet and you want to support the channel, please subscribe. Help subscribe. It helps out a lot. For now, thank you for watching and see you next time. <laughs>